Hey folks, Todd Coburn here from Cal Poly Pomona with your Aerospace Structures series. Today we're going to be looking at fasteners and specifically we're going to be looking at uh, what I term non-aerospace fasteners. We're going to focus on the UN fastener bolt standard. The UN bolt standard. <clears throat> So when we're using standard bolts like the United National Bolt Thread, the, uh, these bolts are defined with a callout that gives a ton of information that we're going to need to do our structural analysis. A typical bolt will look like this figure here, and we'll get a callout that looks like what is shown right here. So if we take a look right here, we see a typical bolt call out. Now, we might see all of this information or just some of this information. The first thing we're going to see, and we're almost always going to or we're always going to see this is the bolt diameter. This is a half inch bolt. That is the nominal shank diameter. The th next thing you'll see is the threads per inch. This bolt has 13 threads per inch and this call out here one half dash 13 or one half which could also be written 0 0.5 dash 13 United National and then there will be a term here that indicates whether it's coarse or fine a 13 thread 13 thread per inch half inch bolt actually is called a coarse thread as we see by the call out here UNC this UNC means that the bolt is using the United National Standard in terms of how those threads are cut in the various dimensions. And that it happens to be a coarse thread for that bolt size because we can get uh, bolts with different numbers of threads per inch. A coarse bolt has fewer threads per inch. A fine bolt has more threads per inch. And a very fine bolt has even more threads per inch. What that does is make the, the thread smaller and smaller. It will take more and more turns to, to thread that bolt in. A bolt with a finer number of threads per inch will be harder to start and more likely to strip because you have much smaller little threads. They're less sturdy. A coarse bolt will have big old honking threads. It'll be really easy to drive that, but to start that bolt and to get it in without stripping the bolt because each thread is so sturdy. It's also those threads are going to cut deeper into the bolt. A finer thread being smaller will cut more shallow into the bolt and a coarse thread will cut deeper into the bolt. Uh, however, the coarser the bolt, the steeper the thread and the more chance for under vibration or other effects that that bolt can back itself out and fall out as one of my break major brake assemblies did with a big old honk and bolt with a rather coarse thread fell off just a few months ago for me. Actually, it almost came off. One fell out, the other one almost fell out, and my whole brake mechanism was hanging out. I was quite scared and embarrassed that I had just done my brakes not too long before. Anyway, so in aerospace, we're going to tend to use the finer series of United National bolts when we see those kind of bolts because they're going to have uh, better retention characteristics. But we can see any of these. All right, so let's clean this up and look at what else we have. So we said we have first the diameter call out and then the threads per inch call out. It's usually not a one half cross or X. 13. It's usually at one half dash 13 is the way you'll see this. And then you'll have another dash and then the length of the bolt. Often this is left off, but for a clearer specification, this will have the bolt length. We'll talk about the different lengths in a moment. This specifies it's a United National Standard, and this says that that course is, that uh, thread is coarse, considered coarse for that size and standard. This is actually the class fit of the hole uh, of that, uh, excuse me, of that bolt and how it works. We will uh, actually maybe talk about that in a separate lecture. We're not really going to cover this 
in 3271, although it is useful information if you're one of the people designing which bolts are used and why. This next piece of information we may or may not see with the call out, and this calls out the grade of the bolt. The grade of the bolt is how we're going to determine what the properties are. We'll look at that in a little bit. And then sometimes we will have information about the head, like a hex head bolt or a cap screw or other kinds of things. So this can actually uh, vary also. Sometimes that's left off. So this is the kind of information we're going to see. We're almost always going to see this, actually, this information. one half 13 unc A lot of times this won't be there. The Sometimes that won't be there. And a lot of times this stuff will be left off the callout. Now, if they are left off the callout on a drawing, then it's going to need to be specified somewhere else. Otherwise, you're just relying on whoever's putting the parts together to guess and pick whatever they want. The reason we engineer this stuff is so they survive under more stringent environments. You can't just go grab a bolt off a shelf without knowing what is the strength of the bolt, what is the dimensions of the bolt, how will that bolt function, how will it be retained, will this meet expectations. So all this information is available in the bolt callout. So we can expect whenever we see a bolt uh, to have a call out that tells us the critical information. Now, in this class, I will often give you bolt call outs that only have some of this information. You'll almost always have that shank diameter. You'll have that uh, numbers of threads per inch or and the standard it is to. Now, if I just put UN and not UNC, you can actually tell from the bolt diameter and the number of threads per inch whether that is a coarse or a fine thread. And we will look at that shortly. All right. Now, taking a closer look at our bolt dimensions, you see we have the bolt head depth. I'm going to call that H. And then we've got a number of lengths. The length of the bolt is not called out from the top to the bottom. It is called out from the mating face. Actually, this line should be right here. You see where this, this bolt, since it has this little lip, this length should be actually, I should have had that line going to right here. That is the length. So from the whole, the bolt length when it's called out is the distance from the mating face to the other. Now, if we didn't have this little ridge, if the shank went up here like this, then it would be as I originally showed it. So from, it's from the mating face to the end of the bolt. We're going to call that L in this class. And if you're out there in industry, you can use call it anything you want. You can call it Henry or George. However, if you follow, con follow consistent nomenclature, uh, you will find it easier not to mix up some of these values because there are a number of lengths we need. So if you use the ones I have, these are a function of the experience I have in industry and in teaching. In industry, I used a lot of stuff without being completely precise because I knew what I was doing to a certain degree, and I knew what I was not missing. But as I began teaching, I started realizing I really need to tighten up this nomenclature because when people are learning, it's not all obvious, and to help them to understand what all these different pieces mean and when they're used. So we're going to call this L. We're going to call the, bolt, the length of the shank, the place that's not threaded, to that mating face. We're going to call that LS. We're going to call out the distance or the length of the bolt that's threaded, we're going to call that L sub T. Sometimes I'll use a capital T. I'm going to try and stick with that lowercase t. Okay, These are some key dimensions that we're going to be needing. Now, we're going to need fewer of these here at the beginning, but later as we learn different principles, we're going to come back and use some of these other terms, and you're going to need to understand what those are. Okay, The next major thing, you'll notice that our bolt callout had a diameter and it had a number of threads per inch. So the threads per inch, we're going to use a large N, capital N, to represent the threads per inch. you got to be careful because we use N for so much in this class and in engineering. But we're going to use it when we're talking about bolts as the number of threads per inch. And we're going to find out that that is 1 over the pitch. That the threads per inch is the number of threads for every inch. We're going to, uh, so you can kind of see that here. And the pitch is uh, the inverse of that. The pitch is the inches per thread. 
So what that means is, so the pitch, we're going to call it P, is inches per thread. If you look right down here, you see I've defined from one point on the thread to the exact corresponding point on the next thread, that is the pitch. Okay? What that means is, well, that's the distance between those thread points. What this means is, because it will take one rotation, if there's a single thread on this bolt going up, since it will take one rotation to come to have that point on the bolt go all the way around, come back to the same point, then that actually is the inches that this bolt moves per thread. Or, uh, and actually, pitch is defined as the distance between those two different points in inches per thread. So if we follow one thread going from here to here, that's the pitch. However, we're going to find if there's only a single thread on the bolt, that's also how much that bolt will advance. We'll look at that in a moment again. So for now, we see, okay, the SAE or the uh, United National Callout is going to have this. It's going to tell us what the threads per inch are, and we immediately know what the pitch is because it's just the inverse of that. Just take one over that number, and you know what the pitch is. Okay? All right. So other information we're going to need, we need that nominal diameter. That is the diameter of the shank. The diameter of the shank, that's this diameter here. This is the way it's called out. So when we saw that bolt call out, that's the diameter calls out. D. Sometimes we use a lowercase d. Uh, often I use a uppercase d. We often will need the thickness of the head, which I typically call h, and the diameter of the head, which I typically call dh. Okay? We need the shank length. We said that. We're calling that ls. We have the thread length, LT, the bolt length, which is from mating phase to the end of the thread, L, and the lead. This is the amount the bolt advances in one turn. If there's only one thread going all the way up the bolt, then the lead is equal to the pitch. As you see, there's one thread, so this thing advances by one pitch as it turns one rotation. Okay? We're going to call that L sub E. Now, be careful in this class and elsewhere that nomenclature may not be consistent. A lot of times you use a lowercase l. That can be hard to differentiate between an I and that lowercase l. So I'm using an L sub E. Okay? All right. So let's uh, look a bit further at this, clean this up. And uh, oh, one other comment before we move on is the orientation of the bolt. The orientation of the bolt talks about which direction you turn it when it's advancing. Most bolts in the United States use a right-handed thread, which means when you turn it clockwise, it will advance into the hole. If you turn it clockwise, you it comes out. Uh, Righty-tighty, uh, lefty-loosey, right? A lot of folks use that terminology. Now, this isn't... Global, it's almost global. The thing is, is sometimes maybe the rotation of a wheel or certain kinds of applications will find that uh, actually it's it will back out, that the vibrations may cause it to back out um, if it has a right-handed thread. So then in those cases, they may use a left-handed thread, one that's backwards. So whenever you're not sure, it's possible. If, if it's a standard bolt, it's going to be a right righty-tighty. Clockwise tightens it, but there are applications where you might end up having a backwards thread, a left-handed thread, in order to meet the needs of that application, okay? So you're going to need to be really comfortable with all these terms, being able to spot these quickly as you, uh, so that you can focus on whatever problem or engineering problem we're trying to solve. Let's take a little more look at this pitch idea and the lead idea. I told you that there's a single, if there's a single thread, the pitch is equal to the lead. Let's take a look at this. Imagine you've got a witch's castle on top of a mountain, and there's a single road going around this mountain to go up to the top. If you take that distance from the road at one point, as we see here, to the road, the next place where the road is in that same position, so from here to here, that's what we're defining is the pitch. And you can see if you go up the road, you're going to get to that point. And then we got to go all the way around the thing. That's one turn 
uh, to when we go around the road. So one rotation of the mountain gets you one pitch forward. So the lead is equal to pitch when we have a single threaded bolt or mountain. You'll notice there's only one start for the path on this path up the mountain, okay? Now let's take a look at if there's two threads. If there are two threads or two paths, that means you're going to have a path here. And actually, this path is shown here, but it'd be, it'd, be, it'd be back here on the far side of the thing. Let's see, this goes wrong like this. So we got two path starts. Now when you follow thread number one, you see it goes like this, okay? Now if we look at one of those paths and the next path we see, then we see, we call that the pitch. But you'll notice that distance is not to the same path. If we actually are on this path here, path number one, we're going to actually jump past that point and return up here. So the pitch is actually one half of the lead. If you rotate this once, you actually, to, to uh, rotating once or going around the path, one rotation gets you up two pitches. So for one thread, we see a single rotation, the lead or the advancement up the, the mountain the lead is equal to the pitch. If we have two threads, we see that the lead is twice the pitch. If we had three threads, the lead would be three times the pitch because each road or thread or path is leaping over the other. This gives us these relations, erasing the stuff on the slide. We then can see that the lead is equal to the pitch. If we have a single thread, the lead is equal to two times the pitch on a double thread. And if we use a general relation where we define the number of threads on the bolt, right, the number of thread starts is little n, then the lead is going to be np, okay? All right, next idea. Now let's take a look at how this is cut. Now we can actually go uh, spend an entire career understanding how to cut these threads well and how to design bolts with the right angles to get the best effect and uh, the angle between the threads and everything else. But focusing on the things we need for this class, we have the major diameter, which is basically your nominal diameter. Then you've got the minor diameter, which is the thinnest part, or once you've cut down into the deepest part of the bolt. And between that, you've got this theoretical, what's called the pitch diameter, which is often used for bolt design and for everything else. Now, if we take a section cut through here, you'll notice we never have, once we're into the thread, now when we're on the shank, we have the shank diameter. If we take a cut, the diameter is the shank diameter. But if we take a cut, no matter where we cut it, whether we cut through the thickest piece of the thread or the thinnest piece, we don't have these lined up because these are not swaged where they go up and down. These are paths. So you'll notice if you take this section, this red section cut, as I show you here, we see that that cuts through uh, different diameters. If we cut through the biggest piece at the top, if we had cut through, if we had cut through this point here, where we're at the largest piece here, then we're in a smaller piece over here. If we cut through this part, the smallest at the top, then we're thicker down here. So actually, if our bolt looks like this, looking at the shank, our thread is cut such that we're going to see something missing like this, okay? So we never quite have the shank diameter, and we never quite have the minor diameter. We always have something in between. For this reason, uh, in order to take advantage of this and have a more accurate, uh, accurate value for tension area, we use the tension area of the bolt. And if you take, uh, and they've, they've done testing of this, and they've shown that if you have an unthreaded rod with a diameter equal to the average or the mean of the pitch diameter and the minor diameter, then you basically get roughly the same strength. And this is what we're defining as, then, the tension area. So you can actually calculate this from the pitch for a standard thread, 
But instead, in our class, we're going to focus on tabulated values for the United National Bolt. This is a common way of getting this. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to get a table like this, and you can find this table in your handbook. You've got the size here, and that's the diameter that we saw in that bolt call out. We saw that, we looked at that half inch diameter bolt before, right? This is the decimal equivalent to that. Sometimes when we get very small, like a number 12, number 10, it's no longer the actual diameter that's called out. It's just an integer. A 12 is a 0.216, a 10, number 10 is a 0.19 or 0.1875. Okay, so this says the half inch diameter, but now you'll notice here that we've got, this is like two tables in one because these, the, this, these two columns go with all the data over here, but then we have this piece of data for coarse threads and this piece of data for fine threads. So if we see a half inch, and they're also very fine threads, you're not seeing these in extra coarse, we're not going to showing those. We're going to just focus on these most common of bolts. If we have a half inch bolt, it might have 13 threads per inch or 20 threads per inch. If it's 13 threads per inch, we call that coarse. If it's 20 threads per inch, we call that fine. And if it's 13 threads per inch, then our tension area is this value, 0.1419 inches squared. And if we have 20 threads per inch, then it's 0.1599. Remember I told you if we have a finer thread, then the thread doesn't cut as deep in, so we have a little larger tension uh, area, which means that's going to perform a little better in tension, although those threads are going to strip easier. Okay? So be sure you can read this. What this means is if we have, a, say, a 1-inch bolt, a 1-inch dash 8, 8 threads per inch is a coarse bolt. A 1 inch dash 12 is a fine bolt. A quarter inch dash 28 is a fine bolt. It's a fine thread. A 1 quarter dash 20 is a coarse thread. So whether we have a fine thread, then we're going to, if we have a fine thread, then we will find the tension areas here. And if we have a coarse thread, we will find the tension areas there. So whenever we're analyzing this bolt for tension, this is where we're going to get that data. Now, if we load this bolt in shear, normally your, your, uh, your part will be designed so that if we have a bolt clamping up a couple plates, we'll have threads down here, and the plates will be laid out so that when they are put together, that the shear plane is here at the shank. Otherwise, it's a poor design. So if we pull on this thing, then the minimum area will be here in where we have to have this tension area that we have from over here. But if we load this in shear, then the shear is reacted by the bolt nominal diameter as long as those plates are set up so that the interface between the plates is somewhere in the shank of the bolt as it should be for 99% of bolt designs. So if you ever run out to get a bolt from the store and the bolt you took out of your car has a shank and threads and you place it with a fully threaded bolt, you're, you are more likely to have a failure you don't expect because that means you've got less area in the tension area and you're loading up that, that smaller area in shear as well where you've got all these stress risers due to the threads. Got it? Okay. Now, if we want the, if we know what the grade of the bolt, if we have an SAE version of the United National Bolt, then uh, we look at the grade. You'll notice this leftmost column lists out some grades for the SAE standard bolts. So if we have a grade eight, that's a very common bolt. Um, and if we're within this size range, then we're going to find an FTU, FTY, and the proportional limit, or the proof strength, are these values. 150 KSI FTU, 130 KSI FTY, 120 KSI proof strength. We'll look at that proof strength in a moment. This happens to be a medium carbon alloy bolt, and actually when... If it's made to this SAE standard, then the back of the bolt, the head of the bolt, should look like this. It should have some ridges that have this pattern. If you ever see this pattern, this tells you if, that this is SAE bolt, 
is a grade eight bolt. So if you ever get a buy a bolt from Home Depot, if it's an SAE bolt, you can look at the head. And if you see that pattern, you know it's grade eight, 150 KSI FTU. Now, if you have a grade five bolt, you have to first say, okay, are we between this diameter range or this diameter range? If we're the smaller diameter range, then these are our allowables. And if we're the bigger range, we're these, these allowables. This is a quenched and tempered medium carbon steel. And it looks like this on the back end. So if you see this on an SAE bolt, it means it's grade five. If you see this on an SAE bolt, it means it's grade 5.2. If you see nothing on an SAE bolt, if it's an SAE bolt, it means it's either grade one, two, or four. And so on. Got it? That's how we can get, if we know what the grade of the bolt is, we can figure out what our strength is from this table. And there's all kinds of other tabulated data out there under other great textbooks in industry and handbooks that you can pull up if you don't find what you need in this particular table. Now, if we happen to have a United National bolt that's cut to an ASTM standard, then you will find the grade numbers are a little different. They are what we see here, and for those different grade numbers, we've got our strengths, the same kind of strengths. Some of them have different values for different diameters, and some of them, all diameters have the same thing. It tells us what the material is, and once again, we see some numbers on the back and some patterns, and we can see if we have that pattern, we know what bolt it is. So that's how we get our strength from the bolt call out. Now, the next thing we need to do uh, is understand the strengths of bolts. So if we think back to our stress strain curve, we can look at the same thing for bolts. And it's going to look similar. They're going to tend to be a little harder, a little bit less yielding since they're a tempered steel, right? It's a little less yielding than we see for a lot of our other materials. We're going to have an FTU, which Shigley calls SUT. We're going to have a yield. And we're also something that we don't use for other stuff. We're going to have this proof strength which actually is, a, is a, the strength at the proportional limit. So this proof strength idea has a couple terminologies. Usually if we hear that word proof strength or proof load, that has to do with what allowable corresponds with when the onset of yielding is and, and it actually is lower than the yield because the yield allows a little bit of yielding. The proportional limit doesn't. It's defined as that point beyond which you get start getting yielding. So we call it the proportional limit, we call it the proof strength. Now when we use this idea of proof strength for tanks and things, usually that has the idea of a pressure test that's 1.1 times the nominal rather than just this proof, str uh, proof strength that we're seeing the way we use this term for bolts. Now you'll notice if we go back to our allowables, we saw allowables for uh, tension, ultimate tension, yield, and the proportional limit or proof strength. We didn't see any shear strengths. So uh, with aerospace bolts, we're gonna see shear strengths a lot with SAE bolts, we typically aren't. We can estimate the shear strength from using what we found in 3261 from the distortional energy theory, where we found that the shear is actually roughly using that theory 0.577 times the FTU. So we can estimate the shear ultimate strength is 0.577 FTU. So if we know what FTU is, we can just multiply it by 0.577. We know F, what FSU is. Similarly, if we know what FTY is, we can multiply it by 0.577. We can estimate FSY if you end up wanting to use that. We're not going to use that in this class. One more thing to understand we're talking about bolts is uh, it's very easy to put... Mm, bolts, a little rod of material, and then start machining it in a screw machine and cut the threads into the part. That actually is cheap and efficient and fine for most applications, but what that ends up doing, you get a grain structure with that rod that was the, the original rod of the bolt, and when you start cutting the threads into it, it ends up cutting into the grain structure. You get a higher stress concentration. You get more defects. You can have little shavings that cut into that, and you're going to get a lower strength bolt, uh, typically, uh, because you have a higher stress concentration factor. Now, if you roll the threads, which basically means you're taking that, that material, instead of cutting away material, you're kind of 
distorting that material until it presses it down into the thread, you're going to tend to get a much stronger, you're going to get these compression stresses where the peak tension uh, stress risers typically are, and that's going to give you much better fatigue strength. So these should have roughly the same ultimate strength with uh, but any kind of repeated load, that rolled thread will perform much better. And it is possible the stress concentration factor on the cut thread actually can give you a lower static failure as well. Okay, so these are some ideas we need to understand when we're looking at bolts. It's critical that you understand this material. We're going to be building on this knowledge as we move forward in our following lectures. <laughs>